Working Cows Podcast, Episode 61, Bonus Episode. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Everybody, it's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows Podcast, here with another bonus episode for you guys. Uh, recording an episode with the videographer and photographer for the South Dakota Grassland Coalition's Our Amazing Grasslands videos. There will be a number of them linked in the show notes page for today. Uh, had an opportunity to sit down with Joe Dickey. He's the guy that has been involved with these South Dakota Grassland Coalition videos since 2013 and been recording them and and telling the story of these ranchers and so i wanted to get his perspective on how this has affected him and what the impact to his life has been and how he has grown as a person as a result of uh, being involved in this project so joe thanks for joining me today on the working cows podcast hey clay thanks for having me man uh happy world soil day all right couldn't be a better uh better time to sit down and and chat about what you guys have been doing in your partnership with uh, uh south dakota grassland coalition how did that partnership happen what what was the uh, initiation of that work together with them well, we get we got to go all the way back to 2008. I did a uh, I used to be a wedding photographer. That's kind of how I got into um, shooting this editorial style storytelling. And uh, I did a wedding for um, Lyle and Garnett Perman's daughter Kaija um, on the Rock Hills Ranch in Lowry, South Dakota, um, and uh, they ended up winning the Leopold Conservation Award in 2013. And uh, Lyle um, talked to Colette Kessler from the NRCS, who was kind of heading up the, you know, getting a team together to, to do a video for their Leopold Award. And they said, you, you got to check this guy out. Um, I had been doing uh, farm work for General Mills. Um, my first farm story was Cascadian Farms um, north of Seattle. Uh, I did a story for them um, for General Mills there. And then I was doing some work for Muir Glen in California, another General Mills company, um, did some Burnett Dairy and a uh, Lakewinds Organic Co-op was some local farm stories that I'd been working on. And uh, so I wasn't new to, to farm stories, but I was definitely new to the grasslands when I when I met up with uh, Lyle and Garnett out in Lowry and started working on their piece. In- interesting. Uh connection there i was just doing some research i'm going to do a an interview with gabe brown next week and um he's a producer from bismarck south dakota yes and um he was talking about general mills has a scoring system for their producers about basically what are you doing to take care of the soil health and uh and that if you've got different practices your score ranks higher and they are uh kind of promoting those practices in within the general mills family of brands i guess so that was kind of interesting to me yeah yeah they're, they're really doing a great job with uh you know the new um more regenerative agriculture rather than just sustainability i think you know a few years back when i was working with general mills sustainability was the big word as it was with with you know a lot of the general population right was sustainability was what we needed but um i think we are finding and, and general mills is finding for sure that um it needs to be regenerative we need to be re- rebuilding soil so yeah they're, they're they're doing a great job with with things yeah that's a it's exciting to see companies uh kind of taking that approach and and seeing you know not just what can we basically cook up in a lab to you know to grow uh but how can we work with nature in order to produce uh a more um consistent product and and a, a product that is 
sustainable yes but also uh, rebuilding those soil those so- the soil life so that's that's cool stuff what uh, what was the difference between some of those products or some of those those projects and then and then your projects with the South Dakota Grassland Coalition you kind of mentioned that you weren't familiar with the grasslands uh, what was the change what was what was different well I, I think the the big thing was you know moving into the grasslands um, I have to go all the way back to the 80s when I first started walking through the grasslands in South Dakota. Um, I started pheasant hunting and, you know, being from Minnesota, um, we had to kind of go across the border to really get into pheasants. And, uh, you know, back then I looked at grasslands and, you know, if I saw brome grass, that's what, to me, that was grasslands, right? So we're going through this brome grass. And, and once I started working um, on the grassland projects, I started to learn about all the diversity in the grasslands and started to understand that maybe brome grass wasn't really the best thing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the big difference between the projects that I was working with General Mills and, and the, the grassland projects is, um, well, I, I guess it's a few things. One is um, the challenge that General Mills faces is they're working in such a large scale um and and they're they're working with farmers um more so than than ranchers so um you know the 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 ranch um the ranch part of it was was new to me um and understanding that there had to be um different ways to manage the grasslands uh, other than just letting the cattle out and, and and letting them graze free um also rebuilding um, the grasslands, um, the land that had been turned over and, and trying to bring back um, the native grasslands was, you know, it was it was all new to me. So um, I guess that that's the big difference, right? Sure. Was there a similarity in that you were telling the story of a family or was there a diff, you know, was it, is that similar or was that, uh, was that different as well in that a lot of these, uh, grasslands videos and Leopold videos, uh, seem to feature families pretty heavily. Is that similar to what you were doing, uh, in other work that you were doing or, or is that uh, also different? Um, it, definitely different with the south dakota um you know these are multi-generation farms and ranches that i'm working on in south dakota and uh general mills farms tend to be larger scale so we weren't focusing on individuals although cascadian farms i was working on a story uh farmer jimmy was the guy that ran the farm um for a, a number of years so the first story i did was you know he was retiring the the next year so so it was really more focused on an individual but it wasn't a family-owned farm um so i think what we're finding in in south dakota is you know these are multi-generation farmers and so there's a lot more that plays into what they're doing than just you know caring for the land to you know get the biggest yield um it's it's really about caring for the land so that you can pass that on to your kids or whoever the next generation of farmers and ranchers are that are going to move into the, into that property. So a um, little bit of a difference there. I think there's, you know, um, I'm, I'm finding a lot more emotion in the, in the grassland stories I'm working on in South Dakota, um, which, you know, I, I think it's, it's really important. I think it's important to understand the why, you know, why, uh, why we do these things, why the farmers and ranchers do what they do um, before the how and the what. So um, it, it's, they're, they're wonderful stories to work on because we get to do a little bit of all of that. Right. Um, I'm, I'm kind of an emotional guy. I find it, you know, a, a really gr- great way to get the audience to connect to the story is, is, make it emotional hook them in that way and then you kind of sprinkle in the how and what of what they're doing because um if you get too technical i don't think i think uh people sort of lose interest so um anyway no it's a uh, you know i think the you're making these for a popular audience you know you're making these for the people uh who maybe aren't connected to farming and ranching and so to to dive off into the (laughs) no pun intended to dive off into the weeds can get a little bit you know a little bit cumbersome for them and when and these videos that you're making are engaging and saying you know we're using these uh these practices whether that's cows or or 
farming practices. We're using these practices to regenerate the soil. And when we regenerate the soil, that increases our profit. And when we increase our profit, that enables us to pass this on to another generation who actually wants to be a part of the operation because um, making money is more fun than not making money, I guess, and <laughs> to say it a little bit crudely. But that's, you know, those are those are things that really, I think, are everybody can come to it without any background knowledge and and grab onto that and understand kind of what's being said i guess yeah yeah absolutely you made a really good point about making money and you know it's it's really refreshing uh to come into um a story and and start on a story and talk to the rancher and and hear them say you know we really started this um to try to make some more money, you know, they're really honest about it. And, and once they started, uh, you know, doing the cross fencing and rotational grazing and all of the other great things, they started to see that, um, it wasn't really just about the money and, uh, you know, they really were doing things that made a difference. Um, you know, and, and obviously not, not all of them are saying, Hey, we, we did this for the money, but, but you definitely hear that. Um, and I think that's an, an important point for them to make and for us to make as storytellers is to, to, to really show that, Hey, um, you know, this is something that, that anyone can do. Um, and, and you're not going to be losing money by doing it. You actually will end up making more money because, you know, the grasslands healthier, your cattle are healthier. Um, you know, the wildlife are coming back. And, and so really a lot of uh, great things happening. Um, I think it was it was Tance Herman out of uh, Sturgis, South Dakota, NRCS guy, um, that uh, said during one of the interviews that um, these are also practices that you know not just farmers and ranchers um, can can look at and and try to um, try to work on. These are practices that that you know we we in the city can think about, right? I mean, um, we have our little plots of land and and uh, are we really doing the best thing for for our land you know um i I look at my own yard and i have uh, a section of my yard that always seems to flood and um i guess we really don't think about that that we have to treat the soil and the earth the same way that these big farmers and ranchers do so yeah there's 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 a lot of things that that don't just apply to you know, a 25 or 30,000 acre ranch that we can learn from these guys and gals. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was a, a point that he made in the Kamak Leopold video. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate that. I myself live on a 10 acre ranch yet. Um, and that's kind of what he said, uh, you know, and I, I have tried to be conscious of those things on my place. You know, what could I do? Well, I've got a horse right now. I had a milk cow, but I don't anymore. Uh, but, you know, I have a horse right now. I've got some goats. I could bale graze them you know to try and return some nutrients to the soil and and some of those things that uh we think about you know another one that sticks out to me is a, a perennial guest of the working cows podcast is derek schwanebeck and he he said when in the first time i ever heard him speak at the high plains ranch practicum he said you know whenever i drive by a little patch of grass even if it's in the drive through at mcdonald's i'm looking at that patch of grass thinking how could i get some chickens on there to graze to increase the soil health you know <laughs> and, and uh so it's the the way that these guys think is is pretty cool and and it really uh, gets exciting and and you know like you said it it becomes about more than just making money uh, when you start to really get addicted to the idea of using your practices and your cows to improve the land and improve the soil. So uh, it's really exciting to see these people share their story and hopefully uh, get other people excited about uh, these practices as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and addictive is a great word for it. I'm finding that um, it's it's becoming a bit of an obsession for me to learn more and more about um, not only what's going on above um, above the, the soil, but also below the soil. And, uh, you know, understanding the microbial activity and all the things that um, that help the plants to be healthy right and all of the things that um have been disturbed over the years and now just you know having more of an understanding of um why really god made things the way he did and why things worked so well before we came around and messed them up right so um yeah i'm to the point where i i'd actually like to go back 
um, back to school and, and learn more of this. You know, I, I was a fine art major and, you know, uh, um, at one point I was trying to figure out how I was going to make money. Um, I thought maybe I'd be selling Elvis, Elvis, Elvis paintings out of the back of the <laughs> of band. Um, I went back to school and got a design degree and ended up being a, uh, a senior art director, creative director for, for 10 years. And, you know, that's, so that's kind of my background, but, um, you know, I, I really want to learn more about biology and, and I am learning, but, uh, <laughs> Man, it's it's a long process. Joel Salatin was my guest on episode 50 of the Working Cows podcast, and he said that um, prior to industrial farming, the American land mass produced more food than it does today. You know, and that we were those the these practices uh, where we have isolated, basically we've siloed the sectors of agriculture, and we only produce corn on this chunk of ground and beans on that chunk of ground and cows on that chunk of ground. Whereas if we can make all those things, if we can integrate all those things back together, that uh, they're all going to produce. They're all going to produce more uh, if we can somehow integrate them again to back together uh, than they will if we could try to keep cows where they belong and in s- corn and soybeans where they belong uh, if we can if we can somehow bring it all together those things are going to increase uh, each other's productive capacity uh, obviously not at the same time but you know whether it's grazing corn stalks or something like that or uh, whatever those practices end up looking like in the practical sense but uh, it's interesting that we we aren't uh, we aren't producing more uh, with these practices in some some cases we're actually producing less and so uh, we want to try and figure out how we can start to regenerate these soils and and some of those things what has been the uh, did you have something to say about that sorry yeah, yeah. No, I was, I, I, I guess I was thinking about, you were talking about bale grazing on your ranch yet. Um, and, and before I forget about it, I was thinking about a, a video. Uh, one of the grassland videos that I just finished editing is uh, the Carmichael Ranch. And um, they, I, I've seen um, the, the bale grazing before but this it was just a really good illustration one of the sections that they were working on and and uh you know he said that um actually this may have been jody brown i'm getting them mixed up because i'm working on a few videos right now but um, <laughs> i understand how that, that goes uh, yeah yeah i have 12 that i'm editing right now from from uh, our run through south dakota this year and uh jody brown had said that you know like 20 percent of the um of the hay that they put out when they're bale grazing is is um wasted but he said waste is probably not a good word for it because the cattle trample it and you know they defecate and urinate on it and and uh you know i have a drone shot from up above and you see all the hoof prints in in this section that was really like salt and just completely compacted which is nearly impossible to grow anything on and and uh it's just a it was just a really good illustration of um you know what can be done to to bring back these soils and and you're so you're right um like going back to you know having multiple types of crop and and you know bringing the cattle in on it and and doing the things that were done before we were here you know when the buffalo were roaming around and and doing the same thing and and uh yeah it's boy it's it's exciting to see what these guys are doing guys and gals again yeah. i gotta keep saying that i'm gonna say gals from now on but that's fine <laughs> gals and guys <laughs> you know that is uh a, a, a something that i think has been an eye-opening experience to me is talking to people who say you know these aren't even uh, these practices aren't even as ancient as roaming buffalo herds uh we were doing things differently a hundred years ago you know people were using cows to clean up crops a hundred years ago it's just you know that we got industrialized and we got siloed where we only do certain things on certain patches of ground and it's you know we just have gotten away from uh an integrated system and and for for whatever reason and so it's it's interesting that you know yes we want to minute we want to mimic the buffalo herds and we want to use electric fencing to uh, mimic a predator pushing that herd into a higher stock density but we also want to remember that there were some people back in the day who were seeing uh these these 
landscapes and how they were impacted by animals and re- recognizing that it was important to keep animals out on those landscapes. So I wanted to ask you a question about uh, what the impact of these projects has been on you personally. How has it uh, affected you? Um, how has it impacted you from a, the perspective of uh, your thinking uh, about the world as a whole, I guess, uh, to, to go big picture? Well, I, I'll tell you, um, first of all, this is all I want to do now. So, um, I, I, you know, I've worked on a lot of projects, a lot of uh, different photo and video projects over the years, a lot of big name clients and, and uh, you know, some, some pretty cool stuff. But now that I'm doing this, um, there's such a sense of purpose and uh, you know to be able to make a difference and and the cool thing about it is um it's not just me i i have my buddy mitch Kizar that that travels with me in the pickup truck and he's a, a old former national not old he's going to get mad at me for that but i meant to say former he's a former national geographic photographer and uh, worked for time life did a lot of work with successful farmer over the years um i don't know he's 200 and plus almost 300 covers for successful farmers in the 70s and 80s um and uh he said the same thing he he said this is this is really all i want to do now this is so i got you know it's funny he's his phone his call is coming through right now so if you hear it beeping that's him so um we don't want to do anything but this you know we we know that that these stories um are are something that can really make a difference to be able to spread the word about about um what these farmers and ranchers are doing so um it's had a a a huge impact on on my work um i'm i'm getting my son involved in this now he's actually in his first year uh, of college he's down in st louis and he's focusing on film studies but um he's been riding around with us in the truck over the, the past few summers i think he was probably maybe 13 years old when he started working with me on farm stories, uh, holding reflectors and, you know, flying a drone and, and, uh, doing, doing a bit of work with me. And, and he's really into it now. And it was, it, it was interesting watching it through, you know, that his, um, his journey into farm and ranch videos through his eyes. Um, he, you know, like any kid at first, he, kind of wanted to get into like um extreme sports filming and and you know kind of cool stuff like that and he's been on a, on these ranch shoots with us and and I'm watching him more and more now he's he's so engaged he's listening to what the farmers and ranchers and the NRCS folks are talking about and the grassland coalition folks um you know he's leaning in I I can see that he's really paying attention and and he's you know, he's kind of got the fever, I guess. It's what you'd call it. He's, 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 he's all in. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're all really, really excited about doing this work. How do you see the importance of this, these projects? What, what is the, the broader culture? How, how do you see that relationship and what, what is, why does what you're doing matter? Well, I think, um, well, wow, that's that's kind of a, a heavy question, but I think obviously we need to take care of uh, our planet, you know, and I, I think we need to take care of the water, we need to take care of the soil, that the carbon, and and all of the things that um, that the grassland and and farms can help, right? I mean, um, so so I think we talk about the the grasslands, the loss of the grasslands being equal to the loss of the rainforest and everyone everyone you know here's rainforest and they think wow that's you know we're global warming and and we're really messing up our planet because we're you know taking down the rainforest well it's really the same thing with the grasslands you know um they can help heal um the things that have been damaged and so i i think this is super important you know um and not only that but um just being able to grow things in a natural way instead of using all of the chemicals um i think you know my my mom lost her battle to cancer at age 54 um i think about all the things that we're putting into our body that 
um, aren't natural. And uh, so going back to a more natural way of growing our food um, to me is, is that's like a mission, right? Is to, to get the story out there to help people understand how to do things uh, in, in a way that, that I think is the right way. So um, I think that's, that's, that's what we um, as storytellers uh, really, it really should be our mission, you know, to, to, to tell these stories that, that help make change. Right. Very cool. How has the, what's the actual uh, mechanics of the project? Uh, you know, I, I think I heard something about the amount of miles you put on for the 2018 grassland planner and, and some of those different things. What, what's been some of the, uh, some of that, the back end of the, the project and the, and the, the editing and the, the miles that you've driven to document these stories and the seasons that you've uh, worked in and some of those things. Yeah, that's uh it's been quite a learning uh there's been quite a learning curve to try to figure out what works best and how to how to best approach these stories um a lot of the farm stories that i was working on um my commercial corporate stories were outside of the midwest so i was getting on airplanes and that's really a challenge is trying to figure out how to pack up all your gear um, and so I think at, at first when, when you start out, you end up with too much gear and then you figure out what works and you try to keep it small and not trip over it. And, um, so for us working in South Dakota is great. We're in the twin cities. It's, you know, we can get in a truck and, uh, make our way out there without loading up into a plane. Um, that said, we still have to be careful about how much we pack because it's amazing how quickly you quickly you can fill up the back end of a pickup truck and every time you reach for a different lens or a different tripod you know all the gear comes out of the back of the truck and you can't repack it so um, we've really kind of got a system now but it's taken a number of years to get that sorted out so um, we try to we try to set up stories so that we're doing three or four on one on one trip Um, typically we spend a day at each ranch for each story and that day will start in the dark um we uh, and and it's amazing how um the the ranchers are always open for it i I guess they're probably used to getting up early probably more so than us but we start in the dark so we can get the sunrise and and uh then we look work late into the day um and uh so yeah we're putting on a lot of miles i mean i would say it's a thousand to two thousand miles a, a week you know if we mm-hmm. if we go out on a one-week trip and that's three or four ranches um obviously we get west river and that's you know you're looking at 750 miles 700 miles just to get out to where we're going and then you drive around um to and to to the next ranch so yeah you can put on two thousand miles in a hurry so and the, um, the ranches get farther apart out here, West River too. So <laughs> they definitely get farther apart. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so then um, you know, in an ideal world, I would come home and you know start working on the stories right away. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess from a business perspective, um, there's a lot of other work in between. So um, it it gets to this time of the year and. Uh, the good news is now I have work to carry me through the winter. <laughs> I have a lot of editing to do. So um, I we download all of the footage um, the day that we shoot it, and we get it onto a couple drives. Mitch takes one home with him, and, and uh, I keep one here so that we have backup. And, uh, and then, you know, once we get through that last ranch story, and usually it's, it's typically in November, late November, um, then I start on the edits and, um, they start showing the first of the grassland series in January. So, um, I am already two stories in and I have 10 to go, 10 to edit. Um, and I also am, have been working on, um, soil stories for the, uh, for South Dakota. So I have eight of those to edit as well. So, um, and editing is, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a process. Um, typically when we do interviews, um, we'll have 
three or four people that we do an interview with on these farms and ranches. And so I will lay those out into a timeline and we might have two to two and a half hours of interview footage. And I know that you've done editing, so you understand <laughs> how daunting that can be then to pull out a story. Um, when I started doing this really in 2013 with the Leopold Award at the uh, Perman Ranch, um, it was a lot more of a challenge because I didn't have a good understanding of what they were doing. So I relied more on, on uh, my Grassland Coalition and NRCS partners to really help me pull the story out. Um, hmm. And now I've, I've done this and I have a, a, a better understanding of what they're doing. So not only am I better at doing interviews because I understand what to ask them, um, but I'm also better at finding the stories in, in two and a half hours worth of interview footage. The biggest challenge now is I'm seeing too many stories within the story. Um, it's amazing all of the things that these ranchers and farmers are doing, and um, <laughs> you can really pull five or six videos out of each farm and ranch visit. I mean, there's so many good things that they're doing. So um, it's it's um, it's really trying to find a, a good variety. Um, so that when you look at the the end of the year and you're looking at 12 stories, you're seeing sort of 12 different good topics. Good stuff. I could I think we could go on and on here, uh, but I got just a couple of last questions. Um, has the relationship with the South Dakota Grassland Coalition opened up other similar work or other agricultural work for you, or have you had other opportunities to partner with other organizations, uh, like even other than the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition? I have, yeah. Actually, I just did my second um, Nebraska Leopold Conservation Award, um, and I have an estimate that I'm putting together right now on a, on a, a rather large four- to five-month-long soil story project with um, working with some of the bigger names in soil health. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, it's definitely open doors. Um, and Mitch and I talk about this we're, I, I don't know that anyone is doing as much work as we are. I, I think it would be really hard to be able to do this many stories in a year. And uh, so we have a tremendous opportunity um, to to not only get out and, and get work, but but also to get these amazing stories. I mean, our, our library of footage is, is it's, it's unbelievable what we have right now. So um, I think that we'll we'll probably continue to, to have more opportunities. It's just trying to find find the right ones and find the balance at home, right? We've got families, so um, <laughs> got to find that balance. But, um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Very cool. Well, I really appreciate your time today, and I th thank you for your work. It's been really uh, good stuff, very engaging videos. I am a, a rancher myself. I work with my dad on his ranch, and uh, so I've uh, even, even for me uh, – it, it, they're appealing and, and I really enjoy watching them and, and gathering what I can from them. Has there been opportunity to um, do work with these families outside of the South Dakota Grassland Coalition? Have any of them commissioned you to do like a, a ranch documentary or anything like that? Um, at this point, they haven't. I'm always trying to find a way to weasel my way into these ranches to do some hunting, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's always a tough one to approach. But uh, no, I, I, um, I haven't gone back and done any other work, uh, personal work for them, but um, definitely would welcome the opportunities. Uh, you, it's funny you kind of you kind of fall in love with all of them as you're as you're doing these stories. They're all just great people. Yep, I think that's going to be uh, something that becomes an industry into itself uh ranch documentaries and people getting kind of those legacy pieces put together to pass on to future generations with the you know as as this equipment and and the technology has gotten more affordable i think you're going to see that uh crop up as an opportunity as well yeah i agree so joe thank you for your time today uh i really appreciate it this is going to be episode 61 of the working cows podcast so i don't know if i'll get every video that he's created for the south dakota grassland coalition and the leopold award put in the show notes page but i'll i'll definitely point you in the direction to find them so great talking with you show notes page for today's episode is workingcows.net slash 61 
workingcows.net slash 61. We'll have a number of links up there for you to uh, check out. So head on over there and check that out. Coming up next week on the show on Monday, uh, we will be releasing an episode with Jason Mock of Constant Canopy. Uh, Now, this episode is going to start out talking a lot about row crop strategies and different things like that. And then we're going to get into closing the loop on the uh, closing the loop between livestock and grain crops. And um, if last week's episode wasn't a paradigm challenge, this week's episode is. I mean, it was uh, just a really great conversation with Jason. I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. Um, And as far as last week's episode goes, uh, really the paradigm challenge contained in that episode is that we in the beef industry don't need to be shooting each other uh, when it comes to different sectors and different styles of production. We need to all be building building each other up and advocating for each other. We're all rowing in the same direction. This isn't a zero-sum game. We're all serving different segments in the market, and we need to come together in order to uh, promote each other as we each seek to make the best use of the resources that have been entrusted to us. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that next week, uh, at the, at the close of the episode on Monday, but that's just uh, a little, a brief, uh, a brief summary of, of my thoughts on that episode. So I really appreciate Josh and Calvin sitting down with me. I really appreciate Joe sitting down with me today. And I look forward to sharing my episode with Jason Mock of Constant Canopy with you on the next episode, episode 62 of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.